five. Um, and we were sent, we were given minutes from the last meeting, um, which are probably available online as well. There should be. And um, I didn't have any particular changes that needed to be made. I carry to you. Not at all. I would okay. uh, listen to the two of us. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> yeah, how do we do that? Aye. Aye. <laughs> You're taking minutes this I'm time. Taking, I'm taking minutes this time. I think okay. either Brent or Julie did that last time, but we're kind of Yeah, that, that would concrete. be great. So. But I'm Kyle Harris, the Cannabis Control Board, for the record. Yeah, we might as well go around and introduce ourselves um, for the record to see who's here. And you can start over there. Sure. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, John Pino. I am the quality manager at Series Med. What, what's the name of it? Uh, Series Med, formerly Champlain Valley Dispensary in Southern okay. Valley Wellness. Yeah. And Kyle. Kyle Harris with the Cannabis Control Board. Carrie Jagir. Department of Ag. Department, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Roy Rose. Um, not with any cannabis company right now. I'm just trying to see what you guys are doing right now. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Ashley Moore. I'm with AM Strategies. Okay. Kim Watson, mm -hmm. private consultant <laughs> with myself. Well, welcome everybody to the new space. This is where the meetings are going to. I think start moving over to um, Great. between here and the Department of Financial Regulations office. We're gonna, they're, they've been kind enough to let our, us use their conference room, but we're going to see what we can do with, as he said, our large conference room that is not so large. But the plan is to have a, a bigger conference table and open space in the back of the building. Nice. All right. So we kicked our first agenda item off. <laughs> I know. And I don't know. Um, I sent you something pretty late mm -hmm. in regards to. I have it open right now. And I okay. Think it's worth so, talking about. do you want to switch to that comment that first, and then we can go to standard operating procedures, just sure. because. Sure. Yes. Um, so one of my action items was to find out um, what it was costing for a full set of tests throughout different, you know, states and requirements. And I actually had a conversation with another woman who, who has been involved with the Oregon as well as California, Michigan, and um, let's see. Uh, Michigan, and who else was she with? Oregon, California, and Michigan. And her comments were that the pricing was around fee four fifty to six fifty for the full suite of tests. Mm -hmm. um, but then, of course, um, as you can see, I sent an email with regards to Robert. Um, from Reassure Labs, which is, I think, yeah. is out of California. I think they have other ones around okay. as well. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to talk with him yet, but he's more than happy to talk with us. And actually, I even mentioned that if we wanted him to come talk to all of us, he could do that. Yeah. And he may be interested in doing that. <clears throat> so then he, he wrote um, to my friend Shannon, who is a consultant as well and does lab audits and for different cannabis labs and things like that. And she had told me those prices, but he says they're really down a lot lower now, for okay. 400 to 600. And um, let me see, I don't know if I can open because I don't, I'm not on the internet. So you may want right. to just comment on it, what you, what you thought. Yeah, no, that, that seems reasonable. Um, and trying to balance it, I mean, we can put together a report for the control board, for the commission, that 
we believe is the best path forward. Now we can either do how how we want to sort of state or uh, do this document. I think we either give the Cadillac model all the way down to a bare minimum right. and let the control board pick, or we make a recommendation about where on that spectrum we believe Vermont should be. Right, right. And, you know, every state, like we were talking about, um, every state is different. I mean, nobody has mm. joined the, um, and it is whether you have the requirements of terpenes, and because then they have to do a different test because it's GCFID, things yeah. like that. So yeah. it really comes down to what the full suite, what you are considering the full suite, and how you're going to, um, you know, what is your batch? Yeah. You know, because I think he defined it there. I had, yeah. you know, let's, yeah. He's maybe got, we can uh, read that for the record. Okay. Um, this is an email from Robert, I'll just forward it to you, Kyle. Okay. Um, but I'll read it. It's an email from Robert Goldman to Kim, and it says, prices are now generally, generally around four to $600 for a full compliance suite of tests in most states. States that have fewer required tests will be a little lower. States more tests a little higher. Have also seen a lab in California that went mostly automated with liquid handling robots <laughs> I know. attempt to come down to 300 or so for full compliance. So in California, this is potency, pesticides, solvents, micro, oh, so microbiological yeah. contaminants, metals, water activity, and moisture, foreign matter, terpenes are optional. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a full panel right there. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard of people flocking to them despite their lower price. Where labs have listed prices on their website, you consider should consider these inflated. No one advertises true prices. These are generally negotiated with clients based on volume or other considerations. Labs also secret shop one another all the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think this tends to keep prices in the same ballpark since everyone eventually finds out the sort of discounts other labs are offering, and this leads to price stabilization. Let me know if you have any more specific questions. <clears throat> and um, I like the full suite, and I think most of the folks who who envision a Vermont market envision a almost organic, high standard, branded Vermont branded product. Yeah. I and mean, I don't think we can get there without all these tests. Well, not for product safety. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. The um, the question is, how do we make that sustainable? So, so if a license is. 1500 to 2000 and then for every batch or more, you know, and I'm using a number that's been sort of batted around and we can look to Kyle who's been in on the discussions for whether or not we're in the ballpark for a small scale. It's hard to comment with any yeah, degree nope, of certainty right nope, now. No problem. Um, but <clears throat> well, you can use numbers as placeholders. Yeah, <laughs> to try yeah. and just you know figure it out. Your head. Yeah. So the what had been discussed, I guess, is potentially around a dollar per square foot. So if it's a two thousand square foot operation. Oh, oh, I see. Right, all the way up to the fifty thousand square foot. So if you've got a two thousand dollar annual license fee, and then four hundred to six hundred, or potentially another thousand in just testing fees every two months, 
are we going to be overpricing be, the, the, the are we going to encourage credit, black market certification right. right right can i ask you a question carrie mm -hmm. based on your role with the agency of agriculture mm -hmm. um you know i know in, in board meetings when we've talked about the hemp program and this issue specifically we've kind of batted around ideas on is there anything that can be done at uh, at the farm field level to alleviate some of the testing requirements in a laboratory so yeah. soil testing for you know and then testing you know applicator usage on farm as opposed to in the lab i don't know if that's more cost effective or not it's just so i the largest issue in most states has been pesticides, right? And we can do inspections to ensure that nobody's misusing pesticides at the facilities because they have a suite of pesticide inspectors. Or if they were third party certified, what we did in the hemp program, if you were clean green certified or NOFA certified, the requirement for testing pesticides isn't right, there. because I mean, you've got third party right. certifying that you're not using any of these products, right? And then there's also the trust but verify piece where we'll test 20% of the product in the market at the agency's lab for pesticides. Say that again, you'll do what? We'll, t we'll shelf sample 20% oh, oh. of the product. Shelf sample. What does that mean? You'll like Purchase. have them ask, uh, ask them to send you. No, we'll just go to the marketplace and buy it. Oh, I see. Or just random, random, random. Yeah, right, right. Random, or if we're at a farm that's got some prepackaged stuff, we'll just take it as a sample. Right, right, right. And test that for pesticides, because this number drops in half if you if you pull the pesticides out. Right. That was gonna be my next question. Yes, it's the hard, it's the hardest. That's thing. the most cost prohibitive yeah. part of the test. Yeah. Okay. And we're the running. instrumentation is probably the. Yeah, we're yeah. running a brand new QTOF that the pesticide program just bought, so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yes, <laughs> What are they, 300,000 yes. now? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's as bad as a, you know, a farm crop, cloth chopper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so if we, if we were to... <clears throat> so, so let me envision what you're thinking. That if the pesticide piece doesn't have to be done mm -hmm. because you have organic VOF organic certification yeah. being one of them or they have did they, can they do self attestation do you, are you looking at that too? like you know they have to sign documents that say we don't we can do that we yeah. have it just because of the third party piece right and then and they're doing it for they're doing that for right uh, so only those facilities that are of a would be required to do pesticides. Only the ones, certain, yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Do you like that model? Um, that isn't a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know how much it costs to get your VOF certification. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but... And they do do a pretty good job, but yeah. I don't know um, what they're doing for producers or processors I mean I don't know but the only concern I would have is that um, it leaves it up to you guys to test for it rather than the producer itself being <coughs> having yeah. a responsibility yeah. you know because um, so it's like the batch is already gone and it's out there and if you found out there was any pesticide it's a little late and I mean you got to do more to if, to make them if they lose a batch 
yeah, you lose yeah, your, you know, you lose a batch early on. You've already made your money. You, yeah. you know, so if you're going to cheat on that aspect, it's yeah, going to happen at the farm level or the yeah. producer level versus. And I would think your the sort of lessons would be at stake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would be my only concern. A big regulatory hook there. Like if you cheat, you're done. There's one strike. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's yeah. If you get caught. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a way to start it, and of course you can always change it, but you mm -hmm. you're not. Yeah. Is there any other states that have tried to approach? At least pesticide testing in this this man. I don't know. That would be a good question for this guy. That you know, if he's willing to talk to us at, at our next meeting, yeah. he's definitely he's very interested. Or even Shannon, if she was Swan Tech, she mm -hmm. used to work for the Department of Health in Oregon. Mm -hmm. She was a certifying um, you know accreditation body person and. She's been involved in the cannabis part there for a long time. I also but now she consults for California and yeah. Michigan and Colorado. I think <clears throat> so the other pesticide program managers that I've spoken with, they all they all do it different. Every cannabis program does it different. And sometimes it isn't the cannabis program at all who's dealing with the pesticides. It's the other folks in Colorado. I think it's the it is the ag agency doing the testing, and then they refer it to the individual boards of health in the county that right. they're in. Is that a product of just the way that they structure local it government is. and yeah. everything's kind of at the county level out there? Yeah. Oh, and then there's some states that. Right. They don't do much at all. Well, I don't think Mass is doing anything currently. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, my question, another question that I have for you, Carrie, is when we look at, so timing, or like if if we're gonna look at various steps to getting a product to be tested in a lab, mm -hmm. at what point would it make sense for inspectors to go and test soil, and depending on how many licenses we start with. Is there going to be a bottleneck there? And at what point does the timing and somebody waiting for their product to be tested in the field or their soil to be tested become so prohibitive that it might even make more sense to just pay a little bit more money at a lab to have pesticides, pesticides tested there? Oh, God. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. Okay. I didn't know so, if that was a concern at all, you know, getting that inspector to come and check that box for your, for your product, especially for, you know, outdoor grows. Is that making sense at all? Um, what, what's more, see, outdoor grows, it's hard to know. It's actually indoor grows that actually may use more, uh, more okay. pesticides, which is, which is unusual. I mean, you'd think it the other way around because... Uh, yeah. you, I was thinking in the context of there's more of a defined season, so if there's a bottleneck at one point in the process throughout that outdoor growing <laughs> season, it yeah. might create some consternation that there's... Well, so the soil test can happen anytime, anytime. And you're going to test the soil before you put plants in the ground. Okay. And that test is $15 for nutrients and 25 for heavy metals through UVM. And you can test that, run that test anytime yeah. throughout the year. And you're looking at three to 500 for just pesticides. Okay. So yeah, I was thinking, okay, the soil test before it plants, but if there was going to be an, uh, an understanding of what on-farm applicators were used by somebody mm -hmm. growing, yeah. what would the timing of that look like, or what would we, what, would you propose that we just, you know, as you said earlier, your license is on the line if, if your soil has been tested, we assume? Well, pesticides would not be tested on the soil, per se you would be testing it on the flower itself. Right, so, so I'm trying to get to my point of when would that actually occur in the life cycle of the operation? At, 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 harvest. at harvest. Right, so, so, so if Carrie's team is gonna be doing that and there's only a number, certain number of inspectors and there's a certain number of license holders 
at the time of harvest, is it going to create consternation that there's a bottleneck that not everybody can get there? Right. Product tested expeditiously. Well, and so it depends. It depends on how we request the sampling side to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I'm just I'm just yeah, raising the question. So it will be harvest, and then either whether the samplers come from the Department of Ag, whether they mm -hmm. come from the lab, whether the producers themselves have trained samplers. Mm -hmm. So and then that actual sample. Um, has a holding time associated with it. I may be able to freeze it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure whether yeah. they, yeah. Yeah, all um, I was trying to tease out at what point does that become burdensome to the point where it might make more sense to just spend three to five hundred dollars on a pesticide test at the lab level. Right. If it, w if it was held up due to product wanting to get to the store or to the facility, um, yeah, it might be a month's time if you had a lot of samples but and that's your drying time anyways yeah right you drying and curing is, is right a month right I'm just asking questions yeah to make sure. no. yeah no it makes a lot of sense because <clears throat> if you know if everyone's harvesting in September or mm -hmm. October um, and all of a sudden there's but they can you know there's hundreds of has to be done in that short period. Yeah, that's why I use the time. outdoor grow as a model, just because there's more timing bottlenecks, I would imagine, that would right. happen, you know, right. so. Yeah. But it shouldn't be. I mean, but most of these labs can, it depends on the size batch. of the lab, but yeah. they batch them and they can do, you know, 20 to 30 to 40 samples a day. Yeah. You Diagnostics at they're up in Colchester. They've got a brand new cannabis lab, and, and it was it can run around the clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this is not a bad model. I'm just wondering, and it does allow for the self, the smaller facilities, to prove themselves in that they're, they, you know, they're not using pesticides, they're more attentive to the plant yeah. on a case-by-case -case basis, and they're able to monitor things that way. Mm -hmm. And pesticides are not cheap, so, nope. mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you've got that, at, you know, what do you want to, if you're using pesticides, where do you want to spend your money, on the tests, or just say, I'm not going to have that expense and I'm going to pamper my plants. In the smaller, even on the indoor grows on the smaller facilities, the pest pressure is less. Yeah. It's when you have a warehouse full that you run into those issues. So I, I mean, on the hemp program now, is that how it's working? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Totally. So you guys go out and... We spot check. Spot check. And um, other than that, people do tests and keep records. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's your data shown? <clears throat> Not a lot. Of, like, <laughs> that we can't really grow hemp in this state. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody's really using pesticides either. Yeah. Yeah. If they are, they're using stuff off the list. The biologicals. There's a lot of investment in um, also biological controls, ladybugs, lace wings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. then the fungicides that folks are using towards the end of the season are generally OMRI certified. It's either the Oxidate, Sanidate, Cease. Um, at candidate, so you're <coughs> uh, a lot of potassium bicarbonate as well, but all very gentle chemistry. Yeah, nobody's we haven't seen, we have looked, nobody's using Eagle 20, the microbutanol <laughs> product, or or Roundup, or, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it's 
not a with such a small state and cost being and can be an issue. It's, mm -hmm. it, it looks like a good model to me. Yeah, I, I don't want to make it. I, I do want to perpetuate a culture around the Vermont brand that's mostly organic, mostly high quality, without the burden of thousands of dollars in testing per lot because your lot size on a small girl won't be that big. Right, right. And I guess, you know, um, it depends on the batch size, too. It does. You know, if you're only doing 20 pound batches at a time, yeah. that's one thing versus 50 pounds. Yeah. 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 And the producers here for the hemp right now, you know, they, are they, um, who's doing, so if we agree on that, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So let's move to sampling. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> so that was the next, yep. next conversation to have or to be had. And yeah. yeah. Um, I have six inspectors statewide that I could devote to this. So we could have state samplers that sampled either pre or post harvest. And you know, delivered to the lab of their choice. Or we modify the current laboratory certification process to include trained third party samplers. And either option works. One is free for the producer, and the other gets rolled into the lab testing cost. So, the six inspectors, samplers, how are they going to be trained? <laughs> By you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I read it. Uh... No, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They are currently trained samplers for pesticide, feed, seed, fertilizer, mycotoxin. You know, they, they're not, you're not starting at ground zero on how to take a representative sample. Yeah. But it's a new product, a new crop. Yeah, yeah. And we're looking so low for pesticides, but they already know how to sample for pesticides. Right, right. And they, and so that would be one. And two is the producers, you say that again, that we could have lab. Train, train third party samplers associated with the laboratories. Okay. Or even not, I suppose. They could be in their own. They <laughs> could do, um, they could have their own person on site, but you, Mm -hmm. you, and if you're inspecting that kind of data, mm -hmm. you know, they have to keep their training records and things yeah. like that if they're going to um, <clears throat> choose that route. It third will. party via the labs or third party. One of the sort of side businesses that I've sort of heard talk of is these mobile trim teams. Like if you're a 2,000 square foot grower, you don't need to hire a full-time team to trim. I see. So right. there would be these potential third-party mobile trim teams that would go wherever they were, you know, contracted to go. And the sample piece would be something that fit in nice with that business model. But I'm, Yeah, I, I mean, as long as someone you had the ability, I mean, to keep an eye on them. I mean, yeah. it's pretty easy to cheat it when, is. <laughs> when you're it is. in that mode. <clears throat> That's why I, I mean, California had trim teams for years and nobody kept an eye on them. Sure. 
current. So. Yeah. No. I mean, in that, in that, I sort of favor the model of having my inspectors do it, but that's only because I'm been working in regulatory programs right, for right. my career and chain right. custody is of utmost. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah, and of utmost important. Yeah. It's on the top and of documentation, my mind. documentation. Yep. If you didn't write it down, it didn't, it didn't happen. happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the good laboratory practice model. Yeah. 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 So. Oh no, I was just scratching Sorry. my head. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that works for me. All right. Yeah. That's worth proposing then. We'll yeah. figure out how we're going to get this all written down. I yeah. don't know if that was something that. You guys are we were writing a report that. for you guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the way I understand it, um, and Bryn might be a better point of contact for this question because we've yeah. heard this from multiple subcommittee members and <laughs> consultants that are helping us out in other subcommittees. So so each subcommittee is going to give, and I don't necessarily know the exact structure with which the report will look. We've heard, I've heard bullet points, you know, a couple, not a one pager, but a couple pager um, synopsis of recommendations that the subcommittee is going to recommend to the board. And so then the board will review that vote on it if, if we decide it's something we want to move forward on. It'll get presented to the legislature. If everybody's on board, then Brynn and team here will, will start using that as the launch pad or the foundation, um, the vision for rulemaking. Okay. Is that so, how you understand it, Carrie? Um, <laughs> it's a moving target. I haven't been paying so much attention. This is going to form. But I think our, our report will be much longer than a one pager. I hope so, but uh, but some people yeah, are scary yeah. with SOPs attached. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is this this might be a little bit different than some of the other subcommittees where it's a little bit more topical um, yeah. at first. But you know, we've the last couple or a couple meetings ago, we we laid out our vision and our mission statement, um, and so we're going to make sure that the report of each subcommittee reflects what we've decided on as a vision okay. statement and and our mission. And if they line up and we get all the approvals that we need, those will form the rulemaking process. Okay. <clears throat> that's how, that's my understanding of how this is going to be moving over the next couple of months. Um, so one of the things I missed out when we were talking about the pesticides is who will do the other, the potency and all of that. There's six inspectors as well, or are you looking at that so, going in a different, because that has to be by batch. Mm-hmm. Um, they can certainly take the sample, but we have in the hemp program now the Canvas Quality Control Program where we're currently certifying labs to do all of the all of this work. Yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, and I think we, you know, knight those labs or bless those labs under an MOU to also do high THC cannabis. So their review happens by um, Bob Shipman, who's uh, an employee of ours who's certifying these labs. Those labs that are certified to do hemp are, are just then certified to do cannabis, and it's the same fee. Like we charge a fee right now. Right. We would sort of turn that over to the board, so one fee to do hemp and high THC cannabis right, right. and medicinal. So we would roll those programs into one, so there would be these third-party labs, and we can just run all the pesticides at our lab, or we can use the third-party labs, but we can also, um, I think the pesticides are really, and, and well, potency, potency is, yeah, it's potency, pretty critical. It oh. is. For the label, anyway. Yeah. And for, you know, its use. I yeah. mean, whether you use and it to sale, yeah, yeah, for when sale, yeah. <laughs> and it better be clearly identified on the label. Yeah. So you're gonna need that right up front before they can even start packaging. Yeah. And the cartridges, or other. Yeah. Will we want? 
I'm more concerned about residual solvents than some of the other. So yeah, it's all under chain of custody then. Well, no, but how are you going to do, who's going to sample that product? The same, so, I, I mean, think, you're yeah. going to have to do yeah. it. They're yeah. going to be busy full time when it comes to harvesting. Yeah, I think we can because that's, right. that's other piece can happen year round. Right. Right, it's not just the September, October harvest. Right, right. I mean, they're, if probably they're doing it in your the September, universe. October harvest isn't going to make it to a shelf very quickly. You know, it, right. it'll be extracted and processed. <clears throat> so yeah. I'm well, that's if it goes into something else. Product mm -hmm. or into a product like gummy bears or mm -hmm. oils, butter. Okay. Yeah, no, they can. Yeah, because that's going to be a little more critical in mm -hmm. terms of timeline. Yeah. Because they're going to want to know, because the quicker they get their stuff on the shelf or into the dispensary, the quicker they can sell it and the quicker they can. Mm hmm. Yeah. So that's going to be, yeah. So if you, the way it's written right now for the hemp program, how does that work for product safety before it goes out to the? It's, yeah, it's not a before. So we're, we're like I said, pulling products off a shelf and sampling and verifying that they did everything correctly. So it isn't a pre, it isn't before you market it. It's a, right. It's a check while it's still in the marketplace. <clears throat> Do you think that's going to be, I mean, is that for, for um, THC too? No, they have to have that before. We, I guess, get to make a recommendation, but I would assume <laughs> prior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, um, like I said, we modeled the hemp program on all the other consumer protection right. programs that we have where we trust and believe that you're doing the right thing, but we have a lab to verify that you are. So I, I said before, it's sort of a trust but verify, and that's what that means. You're keeping records. Your records are available for us to check at any time, and we're also verifying your product when we find it out in, in the marketplace. Right, right. So and what's the what's the rate at which that happens? Which? How often are you verifying products in the marketplace? Um, often. Like I can't. I don't know what the rate one is. One in ten uh, pieces on the shelf. One in twenty. So what? we'll stop somewhere and take a bunch of samples. Okay. And our market for CBD products was very large. It's contracted a bit in the last year. Right. Right. So I don't know what their rate would be, but we know who's, <coughs> we know where the market is. <laughs> right, and you know who's, who, who's putting the par products on the shelf. Yes. And yeah. how often do you go to their actual growing sites? Um, the grow sites, we haven't been to all of them, but we have one person doing the hemp program right now. And you know when we had a when we had that that's where that twenty percent number came from. Okay. So he was hitting uh, twenty percent of the registered growers randomly, and if we went to those twenty percent last year, he would go to a different twenty percent this year. So right, right. So in the span of five years, we would have visited all oh. the grows once. But the products are being checked at a more frequent basis right, right. because you know there might be. Do you ever have to send out yourself? Send out samples? Yeah. We I mean, have. If, yeah. We have. Okay. Um, for the micro stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, there's tests, there's all different ways to do that. Um, yeah. And we wanted to 
see if it was happening correctly. Yeah. You were QCing yourselves yeah. as yeah. well as QCing yeah. the other facilities. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the same is true with right now. Um, we're running a lab survey on a um, sample that we blend yeah. and blend and blend, you know, commingled and blend. And so just to check us, check them, just so everybody's on it. Right, right. It is blind. You get your result and see everybody's, you know how it is. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you're doing some proficiency testing yeah. yourself. And mm -hmm. I mean, that you will... It, you need to do that for your own certification. So, yes. and maybe yeah. that's something that we, you know, yeah. when you think of your certification program, what are you requiring for your proficiency testing? Because yeah. it can tell a lot. Yep. And I liked the check sample piece because it tells you a lot more than looking at records. And I don't know if you're aware of the sort of Emerald, Emerald program. So it's a check sample program, but basically this company sells standards, calibration standards, as well as runs a check sample program. And the check sample comes already extracted. So you get a vial that you stick in your auto sampler. So it's checking the instrument, not the analyst. And <coughs> Well, I think we need more than that. <laughs> Extraction is the most difficult part. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. That's why we've worked in the extraction lab for well, three that's, years. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the only thing that was available nationally because once it was in a solvent and extracted, they could send it through the right, lab. right, right. They couldn't actually send product. So yeah, I understand why they did. Did that and they needed something, but I don't. If you got a yeah. gold badge from Emerald, it doesn't mean you're a good lab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a, a good check on the instrument and it calibration is. standards. Well, because even if you could do it as a not let the analyst know that he's getting that sample somehow, just put it in one of your own vials, it yeah. actually works pretty well. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Make it a double blind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so so that so when I look at this list, let me just go back to what we were looking at the other day, last meeting. Um, if. So that's all, oh, that just happens randomly as the season goes on, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then, but you, so you don't require any hemp producers at this time to actually send a sample in before they can put it on the shelf. It doesn't have to pass anything before they can put it, it on the shelf. Uh, so the potency oh. test, like if it's hemp, it just right. It just potency. has the potency. Yeah. That's the only one? At this point, yeah. Okay. And, and then, what, what are your thoughts on the... Um, no, so the, they are, the potency is the only one that's done really under chain of custody um, because that's what the program is based on. The rest of it, they are doing those tests, keeping records and make them available to us. Okay. And, you know, we if somebody's outside of the parameters that we must post on the website, they call us and say, what can I right. do with my product? Right. <coughs> what are they, and then they have the option to do what you guys were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some kind of extraction of the THC or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Or kind the, of like decaf coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully the, uh, they don't use methylene chloride. <laughs> no. No. We, we don't allow that. But, um, Okay. The hard one on that list is, is the my, mycotoxins and molds and like we're using other people's numbers and I'm not, we're not sure. Is this pre quiet pre? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is pre and this is pre. Any of the others? Water? 
Mm. Yeah, it, it kind of makes it look like. So you you need a moisture. You need a moisture reading anyway. Period. Yeah. And they can do that. Are they doing themselves on site, or are you guys doing? So the lab is doing it. It's done at the lab, and you need the moisture to calculate here percent anyways yeah and that's like on here they listed water activity that's just a that's just a calculation and the residual solvents are only after on extracts yeah. extracts yeah and they the only other thing I see here is foreign matter oh from that from yeah. Robert yeah yeah, that, I, yeah. To me, in the feed world, that means filth, which means rat shit, right? Or mouse poop. Yeah. Or potentially bugs, you know, spiders that got in the eggs or something. Yeah. And that, like you said, it's optional for most Yeah, people. you're going to see it. <laughs> yeah. That's why foreign matter and terpenes are optional. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that makes all sense. I mean, the only other thing is, do, do you want to prepare some sampling SOPs like we did for, to give people the option to... I think we start with, yeah, the ones that you've written. Those yeah. are very detailed, very good. And yeah. I think, oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah, they... I, and, the, and Oregon has no problem if we model okay. a, a very... the same thing. I mean, they... they those were all public. I okay. mean, you can still get them on their website yeah. today. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I think... Well, well, write up a protocol based on based on the hemp but more required I mean well you you already have some descriptions and stuff in there mm -hmm. but we'll make it more re required for the THC market and then And then a way to, if you have a third party certifying your organic status, then the requirement for testing pesticides isn't on the producer, but will still sample randomly. Right. Just, and having that there, like not only would they lose their organic certification if we found it, the potential lose your license exists as well. Right. Okay. That sounds good. That's your action. You want to review the action items? The meeting minutes? Sure. Well, we have. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just do the action items first, mm -hmm. and then we'll move to public comment. Okay. Okay. So action items. Who's going to write up the SOPs? <laughs> or you have them I, already done, right? Most of them. Yeah. Well, I'll okay. take a crack and, okay. and attach your your uh, stuff as. All right. Appendix, leaving them as they are with the Oregon headings on. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Just we can take that off later, but just so. Yeah, yeah. So we see how they were yeah. created in there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'll leave. It, I'll leave that for you. I'll just say the subcommittee will write up SOPs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he's gonna, and then we'll review them at the next meeting to be reviewed by the yeah. next meeting. And then the question is, do you want? either Shannon or Robert to talk to us at the next yeah, meeting let's, and let's, see what they think of that model. I think it's worth having some Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, expertise. <laughs> yeah. And I'll Other than, I mean not I yours is pretty high up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not it's really. Tough. These guys are, I mean I I yeah. I'm learning new stuff every day as I Yeah, same. As, <laughs> as same. they said. I'm old school now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, same. I know. I'm... So I wasn't at the last meeting 
did you look to set the next meeting at the last meeting, or would it make sense to talk to Robert to see what availability they might have and structure well, this meeting around right, right. his schedule? Something My availability comes less in the, 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 the week of the 20th and the week of the 27th till after, and the week yeah. of October 4th. Yeah. So, and so we could either give you that timeline to yeah. do it, or let's yeah. look at it. Let me look at a calendar, and then well, we can just say that um, I'll have then have had time. So, I mean, is that too far out? I don't think so, especially because if if I have enough time and get this right, I'll send it to you. You can look at it, find out Robert's availability. We'll have. We'll each have time to sort of look at what this looks like and right. hear from Robert. And I think we should hear from some other folks who are burdened by our sampling protocol and actually want us to sample more. So both ends of that spectrum from from folks. So yeah. the week of October 11th um, could be too far away, but. Yeah. So the next month, I'm like swamped. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's either the week of October 11th or October 18th. The 11th is probably not going to work. It has to be the 18th. Okay. But we could we could communicate a lot through. Yeah. You know. So or we could have those SOPs, and if you got them, I could review them. The only other day that would work is the week of the 20th, like on the 23rd or 24th. Is this September or October? September. I mean, because I'm actually away, and I could not. I, I could do it via Teams. Yeah. Maybe the week of the 11th. But... Sure. Let's bounce. Anyway. Let's bounce it back and forth. Yeah. A document yeah. back and forth between us, um, and then if we need a teams meeting, we'll set one up. Okay. Um, you don't think need, one needs to be set today? I just wanted to. Oh yeah, I know. I I'm just trying to. Um, think for your next month. <laughs> yeah, I'm like thinking through. I have to go to Tennessee, Minnesota, um, Key Largo, Florida. I'm like mm -hmm. trying to figure out. <laughs> what's gonna happen what's is it a good time of year to be in Florida um I think well so. that's my sister's 70th birthday party <laughs> yeah yeah that sounds fun Sorry. yeah so yeah I mean not really it's but it's the well, best time for our wide. family yeah, not, no I didn't know what the weather was like down there um it's always nice <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe. my oldest daughter when she was uh, going to college um, you know we worked it all out and she decided she was going to do two years of community college first yeah yeah so she went to Vermont Community College here in Montpelier for a semester and then realized she could actually go to community college anywhere and so from December till she stayed out there the summer. She went down to the Keys. Oh, did she? For, did she went to community college in uh, Isle, Isle Alvarado. Of, yes. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yep. So. Did she become a diver? She but, did. She did. She spent a lot of time on a boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my mom lived there for 25 years. Oh, so my God. Like, anyway, okay, so let's do that. We'll plan for um, like the second or third week in October. Yep. And yep. we'll. We, We'll see what Bryn wants to think. Sounds too. good. And, um, but the action items are is he's going to draft the SOPs with my review where we can hopefully have something hashed out to for a product by the next time we meet. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, public comment. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Yes. Um, Roy Rose. Hi. Um, how many caminoids out of there's like 146, I think. How many are you guys actually going for? But there's some that are doing like five. Yeah. So we can do eight in our lab right now. Okay. Um, Is that like, I mean for standards, so if I had a lab, yeah. eight would be like 
where you want it? So I think that's going to be market driven. Okay. Um, CBD and THC and then CBDA and THCA are pretty standard and those are the most um, the cannabinoids most are interested in now but yeah. you know everybody wants CBG and THCB so we're, we have those standards as well in our lab but I think I do think that's going to be market driven um, let's see Do you have any other thoughts, Ken? No. We'll maintain the suite of eight. I think the more the barrier, and as many as you can, would be good, just so people know how that information. Yeah. I think more and more, I mean, you see, I was, I hadn't finished the article, but ACS just put one out on the Delta. And some other things. Delta eight. Delta eight. Mm -hmm. I think eventually it's going to end up going through everything. Eventually. Yeah. It just makes sense. It's just going to do it. And yeah, yeah. Whatever you can see. Somebody's going like to do it. It's just going to set the. <laughs> it's going to set the bar right there. Yeah. I was trying to see which. I mean, I think it makes sense that it's it's going to be market driven. Like, there's yeah. going to be so many different types of consumers. I kind of yeah. That's why I say eventually somebody's going to end up making a lab that just goes through everything. Yeah. And then everybody's going to end up doing the same thing. Right. So oh, sort of be a and the testing, you know, and standard will also require yeah. what people can do. And right now, most of our Vermont producers and because it's largely a hemp market at this point that's using the commercial labs, although home growers are, they're asking for CBD, CBG, and THC. But all the method is set up and they can just add in the standard. Is it a state lab? You guys are just going in and testing random tests or are people actually coming to you and getting tested that you guys are getting? We're not off we could potentially in the future offer a fee for service. Okay. But right now we're just a regulatory lag. That's and right. if uh, yeah. we're if somebody wants fee for service, there are um, a few labs in state and a few labs out of state that offer that service. Okay. The training and certs are this is this is it going through the state? Is that third party what's going on with that so for example the, the liquor control board and all that stuff bartenders have to get certified to the state is that the same thing yeah that's a question for that's a question for kyle or the board you know, if they're ready to answer that okay. um, but in terms of certifying analysts and certifying labs, labs and we're proposing that the, the that program lab certification program sort of become a surrogate for the high THC and this lab yeah. certification. Okay. Yeah, and, I mean, and I, with an option of possibly getting your equivalency of like something like 17025 or you're, are you going to... Um, we do, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. what do they call that? It's, um, I so. Yeah, so no, 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 I'm just thinking when you reciprocity or something of, or, yeah. Because <coughs> yeah, I do certain. know that, like, even with the DOH, if you have your NEF lab accreditation, yeah. it, it works for. We'll think about that. Like, we're yeah. sort of requiring the 17025 for four hemp labs, but we're not using the, our lab as NELAC, which is the environmental. Right, right. NELAC certified, they're ISO certified, but we okay. still want to get certified in the HEMP programs. Okay. Sort of specific criteria, but 17025 gets you 99%. Oh, quicker, yeah, yeah. Nice. Get you there. Yes. You don't have to, yeah. Because yeah. you'll respect that accrediting authority's yes. audit yeah. inspection. Yeah. Sort of like, sort of like the proposal for no fire cleaning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, 
here's somebody else that's looking that you're doing things the way you say you are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question yeah. as much as we can? Yeah. Do you have any questions? Any other? Uh, I have a few points I'd like to comment on. Okay. Um, I personally feel as though it's imperative to have positive release of finished goods, meaning that all testing has been done before product is on the shelf. Mm -hmm. The purpose of testing is to ensure that people are um, not putting harm in their body, um, and that's the only real way to do that. Spot checking is good for auxiliary, but at that point, the horse has left the barn, um, products at risk, recall processes are clunky at best. Um, but I think that's imperative for the safety of the consumer. Um, I do hear the costs associated, especially with smaller operations, and I'm wondering if some of this risk mitigation can be done further upstream in the process, such as doing uh, facility process audits, uh, process validations, things of that nature, uh, based off of a supplier's scorecard, um, if you will, um, perhaps that puts them into a tiered testing of they they have a certain score um, that's favorable. Maybe it's a, a skip lot testing scenario or based off of number of units or lots produced on an annual basis. Um, if they get a less favorable result, the frequency increases. Um, something to consider there. Uh, when it comes to sampling, I had a point here. Oh, I feel as though the sampling piece should not, the onus should not be on the testing laboratories. That's not their specialty. They're analytical chemists. Um, that's if you're looking to decrease the cost of testing. Um, that's just going to be more overhead for a testing lab, ensuring more employees, ensuring vehicles, time on the road, gas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Carrie, I heard you mention the Emerald Test earlier. Um, our operation does enroll in the Emerald Test. To my understanding, it's the only proficiency test offered for the cannabis and hemp industries currently. Um, we've been enrolling in this. Uh, I've been with this with my organization for about three years now. Um, the organization has been enrolled in, enrolling with Emerald for about five years. And from about the three-year tenure that I've been there, we just keep adding on the the types and numbers of animal tests that we do. Um, originally, they only had um, samples that were to shoot or to dilute and shoot, minimal prep or extraction required. They do now offer um, samples in particular matrices, whether it be hemp oil or gummies um, or flour for that matter, where the extraction process is critical in the analysis and is also uh, matrix specific. So I feel like there are more options on the table in that realm now. Just want to make people aware of that. Yeah, I know. Thanks. I actually wasn't aware. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I thought there were more than Emerald too. I mean, Resolute and some other facilities aren't doing that. There are tons of vendors to be able to get uh, cannabinoid standards. Okay. But for a proficiency test, where you have an unknown and you're reporting out on that unknown. Um, Emerald is the only one that I know of currently, at least in the US. Right. So just wanted to clarify that. And I totally agree and support everything that was said in regards to organic and clean green and such. Uh, just one thing that I want to think about, um, even a, a farmer with the best intentions following organic practices and following and that maintains a clean green certification could potentially be put at risk by a neighboring farmer, different crop, different pesticide application practices. If that person or individual who has maintained clean green certification, if their business is at risk for things that are outside of their control, I don't know how that is handled, but that, that probability is probably rather high especially when you're considering outdoor grow. Yeah, and this state doesn't necessarily um, require the neighboring farms to let you know when they're applying pesticides. 
Sure. <laughs> well, the, there's a buffer that's required. Yeah, but, but so that's on the drawer. And um, I mean, I know we have the same problem just in general. Yeah. When with your organic certification, the buffers are great, but if you had, I mean. Drift is a lot different these days, especially if you're using things like dicamba and stuff like that. Right. It's going to wipe out the crop, though. I know. You'd know both. Yeah. But, yeah. The, the stuff that gets used in Vermont, our primary crop, crop is field corn, and that doesn't get fungicide or insecticide, really. So it would be an herbicide, and herbicide drift would, the crop wouldn't make it to market. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there'd be suits trying, before that could yeah, even I'm happen. Trying to sure, think, yeah, I'm trying to think of a, your point is valid, yeah, yeah. Is valid sure. but our cropping systems are such that it would be limited situations where we'd have to worry about drift that didn't kill the crop. Sure, I, I just heard that it was like one strike and you're out, and I just oh, put myself oh, in the yeah. farmer's shoes that's playing by the book. Oh, and then right. that happens. Got it. Got it. Got and got then got their got livelihood's at risk. I think know, the so. one strike and you're out thing would, well, I'm sure this will get touched upon on the compliance and enforcement subcommittee, mm -hmm. but I think fault would have to be right. determined. Established. There. Yep. Right. And, established. and, sure. so. and our lab, I can tell the difference between drift and an application. Sure. I'm just trying to think of this from all the Yeah, yeah. I yeah. no, appreciate so. it. I yeah. appreciate it. Well, because it makes sense because if we actually only caught it in an extract. Right. And not on the crop because you're concentrating. Sure. The yeah. same the same equipment that uh, is used to extract cannabis is, is the equipment we use in the pesticide lab to yeah. extract pesticides. Sure. So they would be concentrated if there was drift in in a concentrate. Yeah. So good point. I'll capture that in the red key. <laughs> It'll get posted on the website, so okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so grab it and, and look at it. And if you see anything else like that, definitely shoot us a what is the website again? Uh, our, I think he's, he's referencing our website, Cannabis Control Board's yeah, website. It's ccb.vermont.gov. They're not, I think, Carrie's saying once they're drafted, mm -hmm. they'll be put up for yeah. the public you, to right. review. But they're if not you need, there yet. I don't know, I guess. Yeah. But if you need to see any of the, and what we're talking about, you know, replicating for the cannabis side, you can go to the hemp website which is under Vermont hemp rules and okay. yeah. Yeah the agency of agriculture's website. The, the oh, agency find of ag under the hemp yeah, just look click on hemp and all the sort of framework that we're using yeah. for Oregon's website for that matter. Do you guys know how many labs you have right now for hemp in the state? Um there are thirteen participating in the check sample program. But some of those aren't um, available for commercial testing because they're associated with dispensaries that are just doing in-house testing. You figure they're all going to add CB, uh, THC? They're currently doing THC. Okay, they're, okay so they're, they're fully lab. Mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. You may, there may be a list. Do you have a list of your facilities on that website as well? I will say that the board has not called every single one to get their 100% acknowledgement that they will be participating in this market, but there's a lot of mm -hmm. anecdotal Assumptions. conversations that make it seem like a majority of them will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't have to change a thing from the HEP program to the THC. Cannabis. All right, any other comments? No. All right. Okay, good to see you. Adjourn. Happy travels. Yeah, 214. motion to and adjourn. <laughs> second. Okay, 214. I'll have the minutes done by the end of the week. Okay.
Nice to meet you guys. Thanks, you. Thanks, Thanks for you. coming. Yeah, I was so I um, didn't get any answers.